Hello. Today we'll continue with our series of lectures on behavioral science. This will be lecture number four. And we'll be covering the topic of developmental psychology. Um, actually, this topic will be divided in two lectures. The first lecture will be from pregnancy through preschool. And uh, the other lecture, uh, which will be the next one, will be from preschool all the way through death. Um, I tell you in advance that my voice is a little bit hoarse. I mean, this is not the way I usually speak. Uh, I've had a flu recently, so my voice is a little bit affected. But I ask you to bear with me. And if you stay with me, I think we can pull it through. So developmental psychology is an important aspect of behavioral science, and it mostly deals with the most important milestones in the lifetime of an individual. I mean, we all are born, we all grow, and we eventually die. In other uh, curricula, this is sometimes called uh, human growth and development, and there are uh, curricula that include a complete course on this. Here we're only going to dedicate a couple of lectures, but I must tell you that this is a very important aspect of uh, psychology, of the field of psychology. And you as doctors need to be aware of some of the most important topics here, especially those of you that are planning to be uh, pediatricians and also psychiatrists because there are some uh, disorders, some mental disorders that are originate in childhood. So it's important for you to know what is normal in childhood and what is not normal in childhood development. So we'll take a look at some of the most important uh, milestones and aspects of development as the child uh, grows into older age. So let's begin with the period of life before you're born, and that is pregnancy. Well, during pregnancy, uh, mothers go through some mood changes, and they, are, they can be due to two reasons. First of all, they can be due to hormones. Uh, as you know, during pregnancy, there is a lot of hormonal change involved. And of course, the psychological is the biological. Now, if there are biological changes in your body, that will ultimately uh, also influence the way your mind works. So if there are hormonal changes, there will also be uh, mood changes in pregnant women. And of course, there are also psychological changes uh, when women are pregnant. I mean, this is something uh, not entirely new for people who've already been pregnant, but especially for people who are, for women who are pregnant for the first time, and uh, that there are big psychological challenges in there. So uh, all those sources of stress and anxiety, and but also happiness, all that can affect the mood changes. So in pregnancy, you should expect mood changes in, in women. And I, uh, I can tell you from personal experience, I have two daughters, that yes, my wife went through some uh, intense mood changes and uh, husbands have to uh, cope with that. So it's a challenge for the women, but it's also a challenge for men. There are some cases of uh, pseudo uh, psychosis, or as it's more frequently called false pregnancy. Now, there are of very uh, acute interest for psychiatry. Uh, in the past, they used to be called uh, a hysteric woman uh, that uh, became pregnant. That's the way it used to be referred to. Now, that terminology is not used anymore in the clinical settings. Um, they are now called uh, somatoform uh, uh, disorders, and that is to say disorders, mental disorders that have uh, consequences on the body. And so the women somatize uh, some of the uh, um, mental stress that they may go through. And there may be a few women uh, in the past when, when these women used to be called hysterics, some of them had false pregnancy. Now, there are some cases of false pregnancy, but they are very rare. And it may occur in women with a strong desire to be pregnant. So, you know... Uh, their, me their belly may increase, they may have the appearance of having a, a fetus inside their womb, um, they may even have some hormonal changes and mood changes, but when you run a pregnancy test, it turns out to be negative. So you as doctors should watch out for some uh, false pregnancy cases. I mean, just because a woman has the appearance of being pregnant, that doesn't necessarily mean that she actually is pregnant. 
During pregnancy, uh, women also develop a very strong bond with the unborn child. And although abortion is not necessarily a traumatic experience, uh, and there are some myths about abortion that, you know, if women really knew what it would be like to be pregnant, they would never abort. Or if women really knew what it would be like to have a baby, they would never do it because they're always attached to their babies. Uh, although abortion is not necessarily traumatic and there is no evidence that points out that uh, really uh, having an abortion will devastate your life. That's a myth uh, put forth by people with an anti-choice agenda. It is nevertheless true that those women who do decide to have a child, they develop a very strong bond with their unborn child. So this is something that uh, you physicians uh, always uh, need to watch for as well. I mean, and you need to be sensitive enough about the feelings of the woman towards the unborn child because there is a very strong bond with, a bond with the unborn child. Uh, usually physicians recommend not having sex four weeks before giving birth because, uh, well, the coitus movement could affect uh, the health of the fetus. Uh, men may be uncomfortable because of this, so, <laughs> well, I can tell you, <laughs> as in my personal experience, and when the doctor said that we shouldn't have sex uh, four weeks before my wife's uh, birth delivery, uh, yeah, I became a little frustrated over that, and uh, uh, it, statistics tells us that, yes, that men that do become a little bit uncomfortable because of this, and uh, the statistics the statistics do show us that there is a higher incidence of extramarital affairs during this time. So psychologists and counselors need to work on this in order to make sure that the husbands uh, uh, are able to cope with this uh, uncomfortable uh, situation and that they eventually uh, pull it through. Now, as I was telling you, there are, were, there are some psychological changes during pregnancy, and it doesn't only uh, regard moods uh, in women, there are also other changes. So first of all, the sense of identity is altered by the knowledge that another person is growing inside the pregnant woman. So the woman doesn't usually think of herself as only one individual, but she also thinks of herself as the host of another individual. So uh, she begins to understand that inside her there is another person. Now, um, we may have a long discussion about uh, whether or not uh, the fetus is really a person and whether or not abortion is moral or not, but that's not the point here. The point is that uh, it is nevertheless true, regardless of what you think of abortion, that the women, uh, pregnant women who do want to have a child, their sense of identity is altered. I mean, they begin to understand that inside uh, their own womb, there's someone else there. And that uh, they form sort of a, like a team, okay? The, the two are together all the time. Uh, it's also true that uh, for the most part, parents are willing to make enormous sacrifices for the good of the child. And this is probably so for evolutionary reasons. I mean, in evolution, uh, those behaviors that contribute to the spread of you know, genes then turn out to survive in greater proportion. And of course, if you are very caring of your children, then that behavior has a good probability of uh, reproducing itself because that behavior contributes to the spread of, of the gene itself. So as very much as Richard Dawkins would say it in The Selfish Gene, which is a famous book about uh, altruism, um, parents are very altruistic towards their children, and especially towards their unborn children because they're willing to make enormous sacrifices. But in fact, that's a very selfish way of behaving in the sense that uh, the gene increases its, um, its uh, probability of uh, reproducing itself. And that's why <laughs> Richard Dawkins' book is called the selfish uh, gene because from an individual's point of view it may be an altruistic behavior but from the gene's point of view it's a selfish behavior. Now bear in mind that this is a metaphor. I mean I'm not saying that and neither is Richard Dawkins saying that the genes are actually conscious beings but it's a metaphor to say that those behaviors uh, tend to stay in the gene pool because they are good for spreading genes. 
Okay, um, there is also among parents uh, other psychological changes that uh, imply an enjoyment of good parenting as a child increases uh, probability of good parenting uh, now. So those parents who had, those, those people who had good parents are more likely to be good parents themselves. Now this is not a rigid rule. I mean, you may have had you may have had good parents and turn out not to be a good parent or vice versa, but for the most part, those people that receive good parenting also provide good parenting. Uh, and also, there are other circumstances that may increase uh, the way a man or the husband attaches to um, to the unborn child because. Even if, uh, no matter how committed a man is to the unborn child, uh, the fact that he's not actually carrying the child within his body makes him a little bit less attached to the unborn child. Uh, I mean, and you see all cultural depictions of that. You see, for instance, there's a famous painting uh, by Goya where uh, uh, Saturn, the god Saturn, eventually eats his own children. Now, you will probably never see any cultural story or any cultural depiction of women uh, eating their own their own children, but with men there have been a few cultural depictions of that. Now, uh, this may be so uh, because it reflects a natural tendency for women to be a little bit more caring of unborn children than men. Because as I was saying, you know, the sense of identity is altered in women. It's not so much altered in men. But nevertheless, I mean, that does not imply that. Uh, Men uh, do not also make sacrifices for the good of their unborn child. And there are some social circumstances that increase a man's attachment to the unborn child. Ultrasound visits or visits uh, to the gynecologist or the obstetrician also increase a man's attachment to the unborn child. I can tell you as a personal experience that when my wife was pregnant, I always went with her to the doctor and really seeing the baby in the screening tests and talking to the doctor and so on, that really increased my commitment uh, to support uh, to, to support my, my wife during pregnancy and also my attachment to, to, to my baby. Uh, I have to admit that right now I'm very attached to my kids because they have grown, but I have to admit that when my baby was born, uh, I didn't find the babies to be all that beautiful. <laughs> Let's face it, babies are not well, terribly beautiful when they're born. So it is, a, there, is there might be a natural tendency for parents, for husbands, and for fathers, uh, not to uh, feel all that attached to the woman, to the baby. But there are social circumstances that can help with that. And there are also evolutionary reasons. Uh, in evolutionary psychology, um, a lot of authors talk about uh, parental uncertainty. Now, the mother never has this uncertainty because she can be absolutely sure that the baby that she is taking with her is actually her own. But with parents, with, with fathers, it's different. There's always the issue of parental uncertainty in males. And that, to a certain extent, prevents them from developing a full attachment to the unborn child. Uh, it would be interesting to find out, and I don't know what the studies say, but it would be interesting to find out whether uh, surrogate motherhood uh, changes the attachment, the level of attachment of the pregnant woman with the fetus that in, inside the, their womb. Because, I mean, if they, in the back of their mind, they have the idea that that fetus is not really genetically related to them, then it would be interesting to find out how that changes their behavior. Uh, I don't know. I mean, we would have to look at the results. Okay, let's talk about uh, infant mortality. Well, infant mortality, or, uh, you know, the number of the rate of deaths in newborn children, uh, is usually related to a lack of universal health care. So in those countries that do not have universal health care and that have poor socioeconomic conditions, then obviously infant mortality there is uh, increased. Uh, and it's also correlated with low social economic conditions. So even in developed countries such as the United States, well, infant mortality is higher among groups that have lower social economic conditions, such as uh, Hispanics or African Americans, uh, and it's lower in groups with higher uh, social economic conditions. I don't know how it works in the United States, but in Latin American countries, such as uh, Venezuela, my country, 
some Native American groups, for instance, and some very impoverished people choose not to go to the hospital, but to deliver and to have the baby in their own houses. You know? And that, of course, increases uh, the risks and dangers. And that also has a cultural component. I mean, if you come from a, a social economic group with uh, that's in, in the lower, with low social economic conditions, it's not only the, the absence of healthcare, but it's also the cultural habit of uh, not going to the doctor and not trusting doctors. So uh, social economic conditions and cultural conditions uh, are related to the lack of, uh, to, to, are related to infant mortality. Caesarean birth used to be more frequent in the United States because doctors consider it a way to avoid lawsuits because yeah, there may be a little bit more risks in uh, vaginal normal birth. But now in the United States, it's becoming less frequent. Uh, I can tell you that my wife, uh, both my kids were born with uh, Caesarean birth because of course, once the first kid is born with cesarean birth, every other kid after that has also to be born, has, needs also to be born with the cesarean birth. I mean, vaginal birth is not possible uh, after cesarean birth, or, or, or at least it's very, very risky. So uh, in Latin American countries, uh, there is a tendency to overuse cesarean birth. Uh, but as I said, this is changing in the United States. And I think the consensus among doctors is that uh, it is indeed being overused. Uh, well, because, you know, it decreases some risks and lawsuits. But uh, the doctor should also consider, and this is the consensus among doctors, that it also has some other risks. So, you know, cesarean birth uh, should be applied only when it's actually needed. Uh, apart from infant mortality, there is also the risk of uh, premature birth. How do we define premature birth? Well, we define premature birth when a baby is born less than 34 weeks uh, of pregnancy and he weighs less than 2,500 grams. Uh, and very much as in infant mortality, there is a higher incidence of premature birth in more vulnerable uh, populations. So, you know, in the United States, African Americans, Hispanics, Native Americans, and in Latin America, also, you know, Blacks, uh, Indians, and so on. And in Europe, uh, in Spain, for instance, gypsies and people who are in the lower scale of the social uh, hierarchy. Uh, uh, this also has to do with the fact that premature birth is usually associated with not good conditions during pregnancy and not good enough medical screening. So people who have uh, poorer levels of nutrition, you know, people who have uh, less access to healthcare, then they have a higher risk of uh, having a premature birth. And, uh, of course, uh, having been born prematurely uh, also has a lot of risks. So children born prematurely are at a greater risk for later uh, complications. Okay, let's talk about the depression for women after having given birth, uh, the so-called baby blues. Well, it's quite normal for women after having given birth to have uh, some uh, depressive episodes. It may last up to a week after birth. These are the so-called baby blues. And of course, this is due uh, to a lot of reasons. Uh, first of all, there are psychological factors. I mean, after a woman uh, gives birth, uh, she has a lot of responsibility. She has to feed the baby at least every three hours. There is a lot of stress because of the immense responsibility and the intensive care that parents have to provide on the baby. If the woman is a single mother and she does not have the support of her husband or of the family, that may also increase the stress. Uh, and of course, it's, it's, a, it's a huge responsibility. I mean, the baby has to be fed every three hours. People usually joke about uh, having sleep, uh, about sleeping as tight as a baby, but I don't really get the joke because a baby wakes up every three hours. That's not sleeping tight. <laughs> so there are psychological factors that, uh, these are the psychological factors that uh, influence over the baby blues. But there are also physiological factors. I mean, again, hormones uh, go through some major, there are some major hormonal changes during pregnancy and after uh, 
after giving birth to a baby. And of course, hormones have a deep connection to uh, mood states. So the hormonal changes may eventually also in influence over the baby blues. Um, what's the treatment for these uh, depressive episodes? Well, it's mostly the support from relatives and, and, hus and the husband. I mean, here for baby blues, no pharmacological treatment is needed. And this is pretty much normal. I mean, you should expect uh, almost every woman uh, to have at least one week of uh, mild depression after having given birth. Now this can become a little bit more serious uh, if it uh, goes beyond uh, a week after birth. And a more serious condition is called the postpartum depression and postpartum psychosis. We will not delve too much into this because we will cover this when we talk about uh, mood disorders later on and the DSM-5 has some specific criteria about how to diagnose uh, either depression or psychosis. But for the time being, it's enough to say that the depression or, uh, is a disorder or mental condition that has a persistent symptoms for a given period of time that goes far beyond a week. And psychosis, it's uh, even more extreme. It's not so much a mood disorder, but all more of a loss of touch with reality. So uh, the baby boost may become into a postpartum depression when, you know, uh, the, the woman, the mother, uh, develops some of the symptoms that are typical of depression, such as, uh, you know, not having the ability to feel pleasure, uh, to feel uh, pleasure and not uh, either not having difficulty with uh, sleep or uh, not having appetite or eating too much uh, and, and not having been a depressed mood and so on. And psychosis, well, it can be either a delusion or even a hallucinations uh, uh, or just a loss of touch with reality. So in those cases, uh, psychological treatment is not enough. Uh, the doctor may have to prescribe either antidepressant medication. Uh, we'll cover this later on, but you know, probably the, the most frequently used are uh, selective serotonin uh, reuptake inhibitors or SSRIs. The most famous one is uh, Prozac although that's not the generic name, the generic name is uh, fluoxetine, and also uh, antipsychotic medications in the case that the patient is becoming uh, psychotic after having given birth. So we can say that there are three types of maternal reactions according to the intensity. Baby blues, well, uh, in, during the baby blues, which can only last uh, for a week after delivery, there is an exaggerated emotionality. So, you know, uh, the woman may cry over some meaningless detail, but, uh, you know, she feels uh, she's quite sensitive and she may cry. Uh, so, you know, she just, uh, she's very stressed and very anxious about the great responsibility that she has now. So, you know, she may be very emotional. A more serious, the more serious condition is uh, postpartum depression, and in that case, well, the symptoms may be hopelessness, hopelessness, lack of pleasure or interest, and the direction it would be uh, up to a year well, if it if it's not treated. Uh, but if it's treated, you can expect it to uh, recede after three or four six from three to four six to, from three to six weeks uh, if it is treated. And uh, postpartum psychosis, uh, remember psychosis is different from depression. Depression affects the mood, psychosis affects the mental, uh, the mental state and the touch with reality. Well, some of the symptoms may be hallucinations, delusions, and this may become dangerous because a woman who's suffering po from postpartum psychosis may harm the baby. Uh, usually the duration of this is up to one month, but because of its uh, serious dangerous potential, then uh, the doctor should take, it, should take note of this and if necessary, prescribe antipsychotic medication. Okay, so after the baby is born, let's talk about some of the most important milestones in their development. And let's talk about the period from the moment they're born until uh, a year and a half or you know, more or less from 15 to 18 months. First of all, there is bonding. Uh, 
that's the first task a baby has as soon as uh, they are born, you know, to bond with someone. And of course, the person who they will probably bond with is the mother. So um, bonding may be affected due to family problems or if the baby is too vulnerable. And uh, there is a consensus among psychologists that those babies that are not properly bonded with during their earliest phases of development will eventually uh, develop both psychological and physiological problems uh, later on. So bonding is extremely important uh, for uh, newborn babies. It is extremely important that the caregivers, either the mother or the relatives or the husband, really show signs of attachment to the baby so that the, the baby will also feel attachment to those people. Um, attachment is so important that uh, from six months old to a year old, the baby or the infant will protest if he's separated uh, from the mother. So the infant may become depressed if separated from the mother. This is called uh, anaclyptic depression. And this is something that adoption agencies uh, should always uh, watch for because uh, it may be uh, traumatic for a child to be separated from his mother after some period of attachment and then given to someone else. So uh, attachment uh, is very, it's something very important to consider here. Um, when the baby became depressed, when he was separated from the mother, in the past, people used to think that this was what they used to call hospitalism. And the idea was that because there was something in the hospital that made the baby uncomfortable and the baby would get depressed. But we now know that being in the hospital is not the issue. The issue is not being attached to the mother. So that's why um, after giving birth, uh, the medical procedure is, uh, if the baby is healthy, is uh, for the babies to be separated in incubators in order to avoid uh, any risk of infection. But also the mother needs to spend some time uh, with the baby. So for instance, at least in my case, my kids were born, they were separated, uh, they were kept in some incubators to protect them from uh, infections. But uh, every day for about three or four days after birth, uh, they were taken to the mother so that they would uh, begin a process of developing a, attach an attachment of bond between the mother and the child. And psychologists have talked about, uh, about a, have talked a lot about attachment. Uh, there was a very famous psychologist, his name was Harry Harlow, who did some uh, very interesting experiments. Harlow took some monkeys and he took them away from their real mothers and he provided them with two surrogate mothers. One mother uh, provided the monkey with milk, but the mother was made uh, out of a bunch of wires. The other mother uh, did not provide milk to the monkey, but it was furry, and it resembled more a real mother. So Harlow wanted to find out which one of the two mothers, of the two surrogate mothers, would the monkey uh, prefer. And here is a picture of the monkey uh, with uh, one uh, mother and the monkey with the other mother. And uh, some psychologists expected, especially the behaviorist psychologists, they expected that the monkeys would prefer the mother who provided milk, very much as in, uh, we'll talk later on about uh, behaviorism. There were some experiments done with rats and, you know, the rat would pull the lever every time the rat was provided with food. So the behaviorists believed that with monkeys and their mothers, it would be the same. They would uh, choose uh, that mother that provided uh, milk. But it turned out to be a different case. Uh, the, the monkeys invariably prefer the mother that did not provide milk but that resemble more a real mother because of its uh, of its furry nature. Now the conclusion that Harlow uh, drew from this experiment was that attachment is a primal need at least among mammals but I think this should apply to a greater number of animals all across the board and of course even more so to human beings. And uh, he, he hoped to prove with this experiment the importance of attachment uh, when it comes uh, to, especially to infants. 
So the experiments also show that monkeys raised with surrogate mothers do not develop normal mating. Uh, and that's, I think this may also apply to human beings. I mean, uh, as when people who are not fully attached to their mothers eventually turn into adults, they may have some uh, difficulties later on, not only with mating, but with other uh, areas of, uh, of life. Uh, males were more affected than females in these experiments. So um, infants separated from their mother, males suffer more than females. Somehow females need attachment, but not as much as males. And I don't know. <laughs> I am very attached to my mother, so I can speak to that. There were some other psychologists later on, for instance, Freud, who also uh, repeated this idea. They, they said that the, the mother-boy uh, attachment may be greater than the mother-daughter attachment. Um, I'm not so sure that's, that's true for the reasons that Freud said it was true, but it does seem to be true that uh, males are more affected by withdrawal of attachment than females. Uh, children without proper mothering, uh, that is to say children that are raised in orphanages or that are not giving enough attention, etc., those children are at greater risk of mental retardation or as it's now called, intellectual disability, and poor health. And there have been some studies done in the kibbutz in Israel. Uh, the kibbutz are uh, rural communities in Israel where parents give their children to be raised communally. The idea here is that uh, communism is a good thing and that communism should start in education from the earliest uh, phase of development as possible. So... <clears throat> In the kibbutz, the parents give away their children, and they're raised not by parents in particular, but by uh, some sort of a, by, by nurses, actually. And uh, there was a famous psychologist, his name was uh, Bruno Bettelheim, who did a story, who did a study on kids who were raised in the kibbutz. And he found out that they tended to be a little bit more insecure. They did not have uh, serious problems. I mean, the, the condition was not all that uh, serious. But nevertheless, the kids who were raised in kibbutz were a little bit more insecure. And uh, Bethlehem's uh, hypothesis was that this was due to the fact that uh, they were not feeling attached as normal children during their infancy. So children without proper mothering are at greater risk of mental ret uh, retardation and poor health. Now, foster care tries to fill the void so that children may feel attached. And this is why uh, adoption agencies should insist on the importance of attachment with the replacement parents. Because, I mean, it is somewhat of a trauma, of a trauma for a kid to be separated from the mother with whom they're attached to bringing a new parent. So uh, this is something that should be watched for. Okay, so let's talk about uh, some other phases of development uh, during infancy. Uh, one of the most important milestones in the normal development of infants is the development of reflexes. So there are motor, social, and cognitive development. Uh, the development of reflexes is actually a motor or development, but there are social developments in the sense of how people relate, of how babies relate to other people, and cognitive development about how they process information in their mind. So let's take a look at a few of those. Let's take a look, first of all, at the motor reflex, reflexes. There's, first of all, the palmar grasp, and that is when a baby uh, has the hand and you put the finger really, really close to their hand, the child's finger grasps objects placed in the palm. You've probably seen all of this. I mean, babies are always moving their hands so they uh, can hold uh, whatever object is placed near them, especially if it's a finger. But it's not only a finger. It can also be a pen, a pencil. The baby will always move its hand um, as if to grab it. Okay. Uh, this palmar graphs usually disappears after two months, but especially those of you that are planning to be pediatricians, you should look for uh, this palmar graphs because it's a normal aspect of development. If this is not, if, if the baby does not show uh, the development of the palmar graphs, then there might be reason for some neurological concern. Uh, another important reflex is the way that the child's head turns in the direction of a stroke on the cheek 
as though seeking a nipple. I've done this with babies a lot of times. I mean, you have the baby and then, you know, you caress his cheek or you touch it a little bit and the baby will immediately turn his head as if that were a nipple. Because obviously, I mean, the baby is stimulated and he wants to suck. And of course, he's looking for the mother's breast. So whatever object you place on the nipple, on, on not on the nipple, I'm sorry, <laughs> on the cheek, uh, the baby will come to process it as if it were a nipple. Um, because he wants to be fed so it's quite normal for the baby to have this reflex and this usually lasts until they're about three months old so this is another reflex that the physicians uh, should be aware of and if they don't have a normal development then there's some reason for concern and some further studies must be done on this on this topic there is also the moral reflex. Now, this is one of my favorites. Uh, when the child is startled or uncomfortable or he doesn't like something, then the arms and the legs extend, you know, so they come almost like in a crucified position. Uh, so their arms are extended and also, also their legs. Uh, this usually disappears after four months and you can do it I've done it with my children you can do it with, with uh, whatever children you encounter in practice or, or or any of your relatives I mean if you put a baby on a bed and they feel uncomfortable and they don't like the situation they will do like an X they will put their body in the shape of an X I mean their arms will be spread and so will their legs that's called the moral reflex and again pediatricians uh, in their routine checkups, this is something that they usually do with uh, newborn babies to check that their reflex, reflexes are uh, actually working well. If the reflexes are not there, then again, that may be a reason for concern and some further studies uh, might have to be done. Usually, uh, this reflex disappears after four months, so they should be screened before they're four years old. Uh, I'm sorry, four months old. And there's also the Babinski reflex, and this is the dorsiflexion of the largest toe when the plantar surface of the child's foot is stroked. So if you take a child's foot and you tickle it a little bit, they will move their toes in upward uh, movement so that it is a response to that stimulus. And this usually lasts until there are uh, 12 months old. I mean, if you hold, I, I've done it on myself, if you hold an adult's foot and you tickle uh, the, the plantar surface or, you know, the, the bottom part of, of, of their foot, that's probably not going to cause uh, an immediate uh, reflex on, on the adult. But with babies up to 12 years old, up to 12 months old, um, yes, they will do a dorsiflexion of the largest toe. I mean, they may, they will move it upwards. So here is a uh, here is a here is an outline of the most important uh, milestones a baby goes through in their development. So from two to three months old, they lift their heads when lying on the stomach. Uh, they have what's called a social smile, and, but that's actually a reflex. I mean, that's not that they're really smiling at people. So they may move their uh, mouth so and to resemble a smile. That's called a social smile when they're in front of other people. But again, it's actually a reflex. It's not something that's really learned. And as far as verbal and cognitive uh, development goes, well, a two, three or three months old baby just gurgles. I mean, you're not expecting the baby to speak at that stage. From five to six months, uh, the baby begins to turn over. He may, he may begin to sit unassisted and he grabs objects with the entire hand. Uh, as far as social development goes, they form attachments to the primary caregiver. We've already talked about that. And they recognize familiar people. Um, they're not able to speak yet, but they will begin to imitate sound and they may begin to use gestures. From seven to 11 months old, they may begin to crawl. This is different among each baby. I mean, my kids, uh, they took a little bit longer to walk. Uh, but some babies uh, have these developmental tasks, uh, they come sooner. I mean, uh, what's important here is to know which is the window of time. So it's between 7 and 11 months. They may, you can expect them to begin crawling. They transfer objects from one hand to the other. 
as far as uh, social development goes, they have a stranger anxiety. This is something uh, very important, and you should always watch for this. I mean, when the baby is attached to the mother, and then some unknown person comes in and they take the baby in their arms, you should expect a normal baby to feel uncomfortable with that. So they will feel anxious with uh, strangers. And they may also begin to play in social games. Now, it's important here to bear in mind that these social games, it's, um, they still do not have the cognitive capacity to uh, play social games uh, with other people as such. It's more likely that it will be parallel games. I mean, they may sit together to play, but each child will be concerned, will be concerned with their own play without interacting really with the others. Uh, as far as uh, verbal and cognitive uh, development goes, well, they begin to imitate sounds and they also use gestures. From 11 to 15 months, you can expect the baby to walk unassisted. Uh, you know, there are some walking aids uh, that most pediatricians do not recommend. So I wouldn't recommend using the walking aids. Uh, you know, they're not really walking machines. I don't know what you call them in English, but, you know, they are, uh, they're like platforms that have wheels in the bottom and that allegedly helps the baby walk but uh, I don't think any pediatrician or any traumatologist would agree that that's good for the baby because uh, that may actually lead to some uh, injuries so it's highly not recommended uh, as far as social uh, development goes uh, again the baby continues to have separation anxiety and they begin to say their first words, and they may begin to understand uh, the first words. And usually the first words are their own names, and, you know, the names for their mother, mommy, daddy, uh, very basic words. But you can expect them to have a language development at 11 or 15 months old. Uh, later on, when we study some of the disorders that originate in childhood, <coughs> We'll find out that the DSM-5 has some disorders on uh, language uh, development. And for instance, my child was diagnosed with one of those. So that may require therapy. And if you catch it early on, then it may be more easily be easily treated. So uh, those of you that may go into uh, to, to become pediatricians, uh, this is something to watch for, the, the development of language uh, beginning at 11 or 15 months old. They're not going to speak all of a sudden, but they may begin to issue the first word and also understanding the first basic word. Okay, let's talk about some of the theories of development that psychologists have talked about uh, when it comes to describing how a child develops. One of the most important ones uh, was from Sigmund Freud, and we'll get back to Freud because we'll dedicate a whole lecture to psychoanalysis. But for the time being, it suffice to say that uh, Freud developed a theory of psychosexual development. Now, according to Freud, a child develops according to uh, which uh, area of their body or which part of their body they uh, uh, they fix uh, they fixate the most on so at first they're very fixated on the mouth and that's called the oral stage later on they're fixated on uh, the anus and that's called the anal stage and that's when they they learn to control uh, they learn how to control you know going to the bathroom and so on and there's the phallic stage when they discover their genitals and according to freud and this was the stage of life when uh, both boys and girls developed an animosity towards the parent of the opposite sex. He called this the Oedipus and the Electra complex, and we'll get back to this when we talked about uh, psychoanalysis. There's also the latency era, or the latency stage, when uh, kids are not uh, so much interested in sexual issues anymore, and, you know, uh, they prefer to engage in play with uh, children from their own sex, and they're not interested in children of the other sex and then when puberty comes uh, the genital stage when you know they begin to go through some uh, sexual development and they start to become interested in, uh, in people of the other sex but perhaps the most important uh, theoretician of uh, psychological de development was uh, Erickson Erickson uh, he developed a system of uh, categories of opposition of how people go through their uh, stages of life okay so in the first stage according to Erickson uh, the baby has to decide whether or not to trust other people so this is the age the, the stage of trust versus mistrust 
In the second stage, which is from two to four years old, uh, the child begins to develop a sense of autonomy and he has to figure out how to develop that sense of autonomy versus shame and doubt versus what other people may think of him. Uh, by the time he's four or five years old, he has to figure out whether or not to take initiatives in social activities or whether and how he will handle guilt uh, when it comes to taking those social initiatives. From five to twelve years old, uh, the child uh, will also have to uh, figure out how to become industrious, that is to say, uh, how to become involved in other activities and uh, whether or not uh, how to handle uh, inferiority complexes that may arise out of his initiative in being uh, industrious and in, in, in initiating new activities. Uh, during the period of adolescence, uh, that's the period when uh, teenagers uh, begin a sense of identity of who they are. And you know, some of them may become baseball players, rockers, you know, all those uh, cultural tribes that are usually seen in high schools. And the opposition of this is role confusion. I mean, who do I want to be? But also, how will I handle who I want to be? What will be my role? How will, will I avoid uh, confusion in, in the plane of roles? Uh, early adulthood is marked by intimacy versus isolation. Here, people have to decide whether or not they want to find a lifetime partner, whether or not they should get married or not, or whether they prefer to live on their own. Uh, during adulthood, uh, which is from 40 to 65 years old, or middle adulthood, uh, this is when people go through the uh, famous uh, midlife time crisis, and here they have to decide about whether they should give priority to generativity or extagnation. I mean, to to keep on working, to keep on producing, or just to let new a new generation come over and and take over, and. Uh, from 65 years old all the way to death, ego integrity versus despair. This is when people evaluate their previous experiences in life and, to, and whether they feel or not satisfied, satisfied with uh, what they have done in the past. Another very important uh, theoretician of uh, developmental psychology was Jean Piaget. And Jean Piaget, he talked about uh, three basic uh, phases in the development of a, of a child. First of all, there's the sensory motor stage, and that's when children develop what's called object permanence. Uh, when you hide an object from a child, very young children will think that the object has disappeared, as if magic. Uh, an important milestone in the development, especially in the cognitive development of children, is to understand that when objects disappear from their sight, they stay there. So that's called object permanence. There's also the pre-operational stage, and this is when children begin to understand that some qualities retain uh, their, or, or some objects retain their qualities. So there are some very famous experiments uh, where Piaget had water in, 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 in an elongated glass, and he took the water, from that elongated glass and he poured it in a, to another glass that was not as elongated but was more flat and he would ask the child uh, which one of the two glasses has more water and kids who are still in the pre-operational stage they would say that the only elongated glass has more uh, water although you know the volume of water is the same so that ability to understand uh, that objects uh, remain uh, and keep their properties despite some uh, changes in shape. Uh, that's uh, that that period of life is called the upper, the pre-operational stage. Now, as children mature and they enter into the operational stage, they begin to understand that uh, that uh, objects keep their conserve their properties, and that's the beginning of formal abstract thought. So they can do some basic math operations and they can do some basic logical operations that children in the pre-operational stage are not usually able to do. Okay, so let's continue talking about uh, some of the milestones in development from 15 months to 4 years old. Uh, when it comes to attachment, by the time they're 3 years old, uh, the toddler is ready to be separated from the mother. Um, by the time they're 18 months, they're able to throw a ball, they're able to stack blocks, climb stairs one foot at a time, 
they move away from the mother but they return to her and this is called reapproachment yeah uh, some kids uh, they want to be a little bit independent but then they eventually found out that uh, it's not so easy being on their own so they eventually come back to their mother and seeking more attachment and this is called reapproachment when it comes to language they usually use about uh, 10 words and they begin to be able to say their own name uh, by the time they are two years old, they are able to kick a ball, they balance on one foot, uh, they stack uh, six blocks, and they learn to use some eating utensils, you know, spoon and fork. They learn to say no, they play with each other, but not real interaction, just uh, parallel play. Uh, uh, they should be able to learn 250 words, uh, speaking two words uh, sentences, and name some body parts. If they're not able to do this, and uh, you should think about some language disorder, which is uh, specified in the DSM-5, which are the criteria in order to do so. By the time they're three, they should be able to ride a tricycle. Uh, they should be able to undress and partially dress, identify colors. They should have fine motor skills with their hands, that is to say, using scissors, crayons. And this has some neurological correspondence, and this is something to watch for. Uh, fine motor skills. Uh, they have a sense of self as male or female, gender identity, and you know this may become a problem later on with the gender dysphoria, which is a a mental disorder that is uh, diagnosed and, and the criteria is specified in DSM-5. We'll get back to this in future lectures. Uh, they achieve bowel and bladder control, so they learn how to go to the bathroom. They can spend part of the day with adults other than parents, so they don't have the separation inside anymore. Um, you know, they're, they're okay with other people. They don't have stranger inside anymore. Um, they should be able to use about 900 words in speech, and they should be able to speak in complete sentences. By the time they're four, they should be able to dress independently. They should be able to have a minimum level of uh, grooming, that is to say, you know, washing their hands and uh, maybe... Uh, brushing their teeth and so on. They should have cooperative play with other children. That is to say, this is no longer just a parallel play that each kid plays on their own. No, they should be able to engage in play with other kids. They should have some curiosity about sex differences. And this is a time when phobias begin. So um, uh, kids uh, might have some nightmares as well. And they should already, by the time they're four, they should already have some good verbal expression. That is to say, a good uh, use of language. By the time they're five, they should be able to draw. And of course, in order to draw, they need to have fine motor skills. They should be able to hop on one foot. They should be able to go down the stairs with both feet. Uh, it's quite common that they uh, develop romantic feelings about the opposite uh, sex parent. This is what Freud called the Oedipal stage, although Freud's interpretations of this stage have been severely questioned. But it's nevertheless true that at this uh, age, when kids are five, around five, they do begin to develop some feelings, uh, romantic feelings, not necessarily sexual feelings, but some strong feelings of attachment to the opposite sex parent. Uh, and they also become afraid of being injured. And uh, they should also have more fluidity in language. By the time they're six, they should have more advanced uh, fine motor skills. So this implies tying their shoelaces. They should be able of learning how to ride a bicycle. Uh, they begin to develop a sense of uh, what's right and what's wrong. And this is important when we later get to conduct disorder, which is, uh, it can be loosely defined as a disorder that is... Uh, let's say, the prior stage to antisocial personality disorder. So kids with, that are diagnosed with conduct disorder, they don't really have a moral sense. Uh, but you shouldn't expect uh, children to have a moral sense of right and wrong uh, before they're six years old. And at this stage, it's also the time when they begin to develop uh, reading and writing, uh, writing skills and also logical thinking which is about the same uh, time when, according to Piaget's uh, faces, children begin uh, abstract thinking. So that should uh, wrap up our lecture today. Let's uh, do a few questions that resemble USMLE questions, and uh, from then on we'll take it.
So let's consider the first question. Uh, these are questions that are very similar to the ones that appear in USMLA step one. Uh, you conduct a well child checkup on a normal four year old boy. He is most likely to show which of the following skills or characteristics? Uh, a, uh, to identify colors. B, to read a three word sentence. C, to refuse to play with girls. D, tying their shoelaces. Or E, having an internalized moral sense of right or wrong. Uh, well, I think the right answer here is A, uh, to identify colors. Uh, you shouldn't expect a four-year-old child to read. Um, kids learn how to read at around age six. You shouldn't expect a child to refuse to play with girls yet. That comes a little bit later at around six or seven years old, all the way until uh, puberty. And that's when they all have a renewed interest in playing with uh, girls. Um, Tying their shoelaces, no, that requires more fine uh, motor skills, so you shouldn't expect the child to tie shoelaces uh, until they're about five or six. And having an internalized moral sense of right and wrong, again, at about uh, age six is when kids uh, begin to understand that there are some things that are right and there are some things that are wrong in, in moral terms. Let's consider another question. A, a mother brings her normal four-month-old child to the pediatrician for a routine examination. Which of the following devo the developmental signposts can the doctor expect to be present in this infant? A, uh, stranger anxiety. Uh, B, social smile. C, reproachment. V, core gender identity. Or E, phobias. Uh, I would say here the right answer is probably social smile. Stranger anxiety is developed a little bit later. Uh, reproachment is developed much later uh, when the kid uh, wants to be separated from their mother and then he decides to come back. Core gender identity, no, 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 that's, uh, that's uh, much later in development and phobias too. So probably here it's uh, social smile and that is a reflex when uh, for um, kids in their earliest phases of development, they smile, but it's not really a, a psychosocial response. It's more of a reflex response. Uh, let's consider one final question from the USMLE bank. A new mother develops a sad mood two days following the birth of her child. Which of the following factors is most likely to contribute to the development of this condition? A, a positive childbirth experience? No, not really. Uh, I mean, if she has a good positive childbirth experience, um, that's not going to depress her. B, breastfeeding? Mm, no, again, uh, probably uh, breastfeeding has really no incidence on mood. Uh, C, feelings of decreased responsibility? No, it's actually quite the opposite. After a mother gives birth, she has a sense of increased responsibility. If she had a feeling of decreased responsibility, she wouldn't feel as depressed. D, changes in hormone levels. I think this is the right answer. Uh, remember, uh, mood uh, have a lot to do with, uh, at least in the case of pregnant women, have a lot to do with uh, hormone levels. So depending, changes in her hormone levels, levels after having given birth uh, will probably affect her mood. So the right answer here is D. And E, increased energy, uh, no, uh, after giving uh, childbirth, uh, mothers will be very tired uh, because it's an exhaustive experience, so it's very unlikely that they will have increased energy uh, after giving birth, and that will not uh, influence her mood, and that really uh, doesn't have an impact on uh, uh, the baby blues. So probably the, the probably no. The, actually, the right answer is D. Changes in hormone levels.